Hi everyone, uh, my name is Dr. Biran McPara and I am a corneal cataract and refractive surgeon at Will's Eye Hospital in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and I have the pleasure to be joined by Dr. Clark Chang who is our Director of Specialty Contact Lenses here at Will's Eye Hospital. We'd just like to thank CE Wire for inviting us to give this talk. Um, what we'd like to talk about today is a topic titled Unlocking Success to Refractive Cataract Surgery and really what we want to focus on is how you guys during your preoperative assessment can really help your patients out um, by, by kind of laying a, a very clean path um, towards success and then really helping the surgeon out uh, as far as tuning up these patients for surgery. Uh, before we get into that, what I really wanted to do was to talk about what really is refractive cataract surgery. This is kind of a shiny new term that many of us are using um, over the last few years or so. And really what it is, it's just a change in mindset when it comes to cataract surgery. Traditionally, what cataract surgery really was is you take a patient who has a cloudy lens, you're removing that lens and replacing it with a clear artificial lens implant. So really it was just a way to remove a media opacity. Now what we're thinking about uh, of the surgery is more of a refractive procedure, meaning we're trying to give our patients a, a desired refractive outcome with the goal of giving them good uncorrected vision and perhaps more freedom from spectacles or contact lenses after surgery. And, and with the technology that we have available to us, we can potentially do this across a range of various distances. Thank you, Bjorn, for the wonderful uh, introduction. And uh, just in case people can't tell between my attractive vocal persona from that of Bjorn's, this is Clark Chang. Um, so extending from what Bjorn just said, uh, what has allowed us to really catch up with the pace of our patient's lifestyle? Because let's face it, everybody's getting visually spoiled by all the medias and social medias and multimedia devices that we have. Um, and so their uh, expectation of a cataract surgery, what ones were thought um, to be, you know, something more uh, inpatient, maybe more serious and longer recovery has now accompanied um, by the notion that was technology, medical technology and surgical technology improvement, it's an outpatient procedure, the patients want more and more. Um, so what do we have to offer now? So astigmatism correction, obviously have more toric IOL design, which we're gonna talk about a little bit later. We've always had the corneal relaxation incision, uh, and that also plays into our uh, calculation algorithm. And in addition, we now have femtosecond assisted incision versus the manual incision that we've had uh, for the um, for the last little while. So um, I guess, Beer, my question to you would be, do you have a preference in terms of using fentanyl second assisted versus the manual method in creating your relaxation, relaxing incision? Yeah, Clark, I think definitely the use of the femtosecond second laser at, at the very least is, has given us more reproducible results. With the laser, I know exactly how deep I'm making this incision. I know exactly where in the cornea it is. I know how long the incision is going to be, and all of that um, can affect the amount of astigmatism correction that you're doing. So I do think our results are more accurate, more predictable, and, and it's really been helpful especially in a refractive cataract surgery patients. Right, and especially those with premium IOLs, such as what we're gonna talk about. So obviously, presbyopia correction, sort of the last holy, holy grail, if you would, in uh, eye care, right? Because a lot that's the one thing that we haven't really been able to master or del fully deliver for our patients. And so now we have our multifocal lenses, and we're gonna go through some of the available designs in US a little bit later. We have the sort of new shiny term that uh, Buren has talked about a little bit earlier with EDOF or extended depth of focus IOL. We've all, we only have one design right now, but it has uh, both sphere and toric. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And on top of that, you may be for the patient with a little bit more visually demanding distance and me who potentially just want a chance of maybe having a little bit of uh, uh, some assistance up close. You've got your accommodating, uh, accommodating IOL that also is available now in toric uh, form. And so these are the designs that are available within the United States. Obviously, out of you know, outside of the United States, there are other um, there are other more variable designs as well. But starting from your 
uh, prover proverbial multifocal IOLs. Uh, also newer version, we used to have higher ed, like a plus four, ranging to a, a low of 275. We now actually are shifting, uh, or, or plus four and 325, but now we're shifting towards the lower ad where you have the, you can see here with the plus 275 and the restore uh, plus 2.5. And Biren will go over a little bit of the difference in design. Uh, the EDOF uh, type of IOL design, we have the, as you can see here, uh, on the platform uh, a symphony and uh, as well as the accommodating again you have the spherical format and the, or the monofocal as well as your toric design that can uh, deliver really good distance as well as potentially some assistance up close um, and so uh, the question that I well before this is a really timely uh, slide in uh, explaining the difference that I, I'm sure Biren's going to take us through. But the quite before we do that, the question I have for Biren would be: There, even though we may have more designs outside of the United States, we still have plenty of designs here. How? What's your selection criteria of uh, matching patients? Who do you select for a premium IOL, and what kind of premium IOL do you select for, pending whatever patient care criteria uh, that you usually obtain from your exam? Can you talk to us through? a little bit about your thinking process yeah definitely Clark and and you know I, I am often envious of, of my colleagues in Europe or Asia or, or Canada who do have access to other technologies but you're exactly right we, we do have a, a, a nice array of products and technologies that we can offer to our patients and really as far as presbyopia correction goes it, in my practice I, I basically use two different types of lenses, either the multifocal lens or the extended depth of focus lens. And what a multifocal lens is, is it uses technology called diffractive optics. And what that means is it's splitting light. A, at least in the United States, a better term for a multifocal lens is actually a bifocal lens. Because what this lens does is it brings in light from distance vision, and it also creates a second image at some near point, depending on the power of that multifocal lens the EDOF lens or extended depth of focus lens, it works a little bit differently in that it's not splitting light, but it's creating more of a range of vision or, or an extended depth of focus as the name implies. And, and, and this type of lens, like I said earlier, it gives patients more of a range instead of two distinct areas where the light focuses um, in your eye. So really to decide what type of lens is good for, for our patients, it, it really needs to be customized for that particular patient. And, and really what this involves is spending time and speaking with your patient to see what are their goals after surgery? What are their visual demands? What are their hobbies? What do they like to do? Um, for example, if you have a patient that um, really wants to be able to, for example, drive very comfortably without glasses. An EDOF lens is, is a very good lens for that patient. And what I mean by that is, with this depth of focus, this patient has the ability to see street signs out in the distance, to read license plates, you know, 10 feet in front of them, and also be able to see their dashboard. The limitation of an EDOF lens traditionally has been that you don't get great near vision, meaning, you know, 16 inches away from your face, the lens does have some limitations there.